should say from, from the top that in the case of Dan and Heidi, uh, they there's two directors uh, uh, on their films, and uh, for the purpose of this panel, uh, we want to keep it even, so we just have one of the directing team. But I do not want to underrepresent uh, your your directors. Uh, so each one of these films um, has uh, very different uh, sensitivity around your relationships, your subjects, uh, for uh, all kinds of uh, different reasons, um, and. Uh, uh, you know, I, I mean, I think that those the, the sensitivity is uh, is evoked by those trailers. And, and by the way, like, what a pleasure to watch a trailer package uh, like that all together. You know, every uh, week or every other week, I take my seven year old to the movies and have to sit through like these god awful uh, trailer packages. And uh, yeah, what, what what a nice way to spend uh, eight minutes watching those trailers. Um, uh, uh, Heidi, let me start with you. Um, uh, you've made several films dealing with sensitive subjects, including uh, Jesus Camp and Twelfth in Delaware about an abortion clinic. Uh, now, one of us uh, that you made with Rachel Grady, uh, which we see that in the trailer, you're uh, dealing with people who are trying to leave the uh, New York Hasidic Jewish uh, community. Um, uh, let me start by by asking you for an example of a scene in your film. Um, where you know, the stakes are really high, where uh, in, in in the sensitivity around what you're filming uh, for the subject in, in your film, and how you dealt with that. There are so many on this project, so I'm going to try to focus on um, on one. Oh man! Well, they all revolve around one one of our subjects, Etty. She's the only female character in the film, and she files for a divorce from her abusive husband in the first act, and then that act alone, by, by going around the rabbinical courts and by not keeping it in the community, this house of cards totally implodes on her head, and very rapidly uh, a series of events begin um, that, that ends, well you have to see the movie, but um, badly for her. Uh, uh, actually, let me ask, how many people have seen one of us uh, yet? It's, uh, oh, oh nice. It's playing so, two mm -hmm. more times next week. <laughs> uh, ask me about that. Uh, so, um, in any case, um, I'll try to condense it. Um, the, the, her husband, the family, uh, the court, no one could know we were making this film. Uh, because it could affect the outcome of her court case, because it could be dangerous for her, because we'd agreed not to show her face in the movie. And so how do you show the daily goings on of someone's life if you have to have your crew enter like on 20 minute intervals and uh, reduce the camera to a tiny backpack, etc.? What do you do when you have to film someone on the street, you use long lenses? And so everything had to be specially choreographed around her. But for example, there's um, a scene where she, she gets a supervised visit with her children um, scratch that. There's a scene where she gets run over by a, uh, a car, um, and she uh, it was on her bicycle, and the community had been griping about her riding her bicycle. We have several phone calls where our, she's telling her therapist, "My kids tell me that he's going to run. That my husband, ex-husband, told my children that he's going to run me over on the bike." So we have all of these phone calls. We have all of this um, sort of preface, and then indeed she's riding her bike, and some someone hits her and run, drives off. Um, so. We needed to show this had happened, but this woman's life is falling apart, and here we are trying to make a film about her, and you're calling her up because you, you're worried about her. You, you heard she was in the hospital. You want to make sure she's okay, and then you want to go and bring your camera into her house where no one knows we're filming, and the landlords put cameras in the hallway. The whole thing is a mess. It's like, what are we doing? You know, it, it's like we're trying to tell the story. We're trying to be a good friend. You're trying to be a good person, and it gets all mangled up and confusing. And but then we must do this to show the audience what happened. Otherwise, it didn't happen. If we don't show it, it didn't happen. It's her word. There's no proof. And so there's those kind of situations where it was very sensitive, and she's got you know um, stitches on her face, and we need to shoot that. And so um, you know it was one of that conversation. Like we need to get in there. We need to show it. We need to go in. Uh, unbeknownst to others, and sensitively, in some way, get a few shots to tell the story beat. So there's one example where, like, you know, it's sensitivity upon sensitivity, and then, you know, you've got your own ethical and moral quandaries about what you're doing, at what point is it exploitation, and these are things that we all ask ourselves every single day, um, probably all of us, on making these films, and there, there's one example, and 
in the end, we filmed it, and, and we always make these decisions in the edit. Uh, you can save yourself from an exploitive move by just not putting it in the movie. And so we film everything as long as no one's getting hurt in front of us. Um, we endeavor to shoot it all, and then we decide what's right and wrong in the edit months later. Sorry for the long-winded answer. Uh, it's uh, worthwhile. Uh -huh. um, uh, Peter Nix, in your film, The Force, you're embedded with the Oakland uh, police force for, was it two years that uh, you were in there? Um, in your in your previous film, uh, The Waiting Room, uh, you were uh, documenting the waiting room of a hospital uh, in Oakland, so you're, you're not a stranger to being in uh, very sensitive uh, situations. You must have known, going into uh, this film, filming the police force, that you were gonna be facing all kinds of ethical dilemmas uh, and, uh, and challenges in, uh, in filming. I wonder what you were prepared for and what uh, you were actually faced with. Was you know, was it different? Well, I went, I, you know, I went into it with some degree of na naivete. You, you know, I think um, you know, we we kind of uh, at, le at least my I, I have a also ultimate faith in sort of people and institutions on, on on some level. Although I think it's important for us to really understand these institutions and hold them hold them to to account, um, and that, that's why it's sort of the value proposition of, of my nonprofit's work is getting access to these difficult places in the waiting room. You know, the, the motto of that film was the system may be broken, but the people are not. But in this particular film, uh, not only is the system broken, but so are many of the people. And, and so we went into that understanding that uh, that, that first year of engaging this, the space, the people, um, without the cameras was trying to get access, trying to get the MOU signed, trying to sort of negotiate with the city attorneys, Negotiate with stakeholders, community activists, individual cops, and you know we got a, a, you know, a lot of sort of you know questioning, you know stares or sort of that, that 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 sort of coldness that you get from someone that you don't know that 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 you're trying where you're trying to build that trust and that that process took about a year even before we filmed where we we knew that uh, this was not a, that we were going to be getting it from the community. And we were going to be getting it from the police in terms of how we were representing uh, their humanity, and their voice in, in that story, and that was a very daunting thing to to approach. But like Heidi was saying, if, if you know, our democracy sort of relies on us getting a view inside these institutions, and we must tell these, someone must tell these stories, and the average person does not have the the ability to get into into that intimate view, and so that that kind of propelled us. Uh, forward into that into that scary place. Let me uh, ask a follow up to that. You know, when you're filming with police officers, that seems to be you know an accepted part of their job to be documented um, by uh, the media, and um, and you're you're filming them on the job. The the people whose lives the police officers are encountering didn't necessarily uh, sign up to um, didn't definitely did not sign up to, uh, to be filmed on camera that day. You, you might be filming them on the worst day uh, of their life. Um, uh, you know, how do you think about uh, those situations? It's incredibly troubling. I mean, the, the same thing is happening though. You know, everyone, has the, everyone in this audience has the right to film a police officer um, doing their job in, in, in public. And so for, in terms of, we, we, we had a First Amendment attorney. We sort of really got sort of down into the nitty gritty of what our legal rights were um, as, as, as journalists and filmmakers. And then, again, like Heidi was saying, it, it gets into sort of ethically, what do you feel comfortable? So, so we, we took the approach of we, as long as we were there, we were gonna document everything as deeply and, and, and as thoroughly as we could possibly could, even knowing that we were dealing with, you know, someone's being arrested. Are they guilty? Are they innocent? You know, are we gonna, are we gonna without them having had the benefit of the justice system, are we gonna put them on screen, making them, and it's when you look at the community, like a city like Oakland, through the lens of a police department, it's not a pretty picture. And, and really trying to sort of bring context to that. So uh, much of what we shot, you know, did not make the film for those very reasons. Uh, we had to make those decisions. And what is the question of uh, release forms uh, uh, come up in this? It, in public, you don't need a release. I mean, it gets a little trickier with audio. Audio is actually a little bit more protected 
than, than, than video. If someone does not know that you are recording them, their, their voice, that, that can get you into trouble. But as long as... Well, that's the, state by state. It, 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 it varies from state. California is a two-party state, Yes, right? California is a two-party state. It's a one-party state, which is why we were able to use phone calls in, in our film. Interesting. That only one yeah. person knew about, because otherwise that would have been illegal. You're working in the wrong state, Pete. <laughs> <laughs> DC, I know. But then that's where you get back to some, some of the ethical question because legally you, you, we, we did have a right to do a, a surprising a lot like you, we couldn't go into people's homes but um, th this you know gets back to the representation too of that community we're not coming in you know from California going to New York and making a film this is I'm from this community I have relationships with, pe with people in the community and I know those relationships are going to continue after the film comes out and that reconciling that personal relationship with your responsibility as a teller, ultimately, um, you have to understand you know, what your purpose is going in so you can make those decisions in the edit. Um, Amanda, uh, we saw the trailer for Step about these girls in high school girls in Baltimore. This is your first film. You have a background as a uh, Tony winning Broadway producer. Um, uh, the you know, real sensitivity among the layers of sensitivity that you're dealing with is first of all you're dealing with uh, uh, you've, uh, 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 kids uh, really minors yeah, yeah. minors um, uh, so and uh, minors from you know difficult backgrounds with a lot of uh, uh, adversity uh, and trouble in, in their lives um, uh, talk to me about how you worked through those issues. Well, I, I do have a background in Broadway producing, but on the side of my Broadway career for the last decade, I've been making shorts about first generation students going to college and girls' education, gone in lots of homes and lots of schools and met lots of principals and college counselors. And um, when I saw the step team for the first time was the first time I felt like I needed it to be longer than a short. I needed to make the film, um, much because of my Broadway background. To me, it was what happens in a great musical. But I met, these girls when they were 11 years old. I'm born and raised in Baltimore, much like you. Relationships in the community connected me with the school. And I met them when they were 11. I met Blessing when she was 11 years old. She sat down in front of my camera. I was making a short. And I just knew that there was something magical inside this person. And um, then I met Corey, then I met Nisa, then I met Tim, met them all. And um, they were very used to me coming in out of their school about five or six times a year with cameras and telling me shorts. They saw the shorts that I had made about young people that reminded themselves of them and their mothers. And they, I think they knew the tone of my storytelling from that. So I think that was a big factor in the trust. But the truth of the matter is that I didn't know that there was a documentary till the eighth grade. And then I didn't start anything until the ninth grade when I met with all the families I had they came to school I said for those of you that haven't seen my films here's an example of my of my tone and um, I said I think we have an opportunity here this step team is incredible they are the first in their families to go to college they are going to be the founding class of the school um, you know I think we need to change the conversation about Baltimore and everyone in the room agreed they said okay let's do it and I spent ninth grade I only filmed them stepping I didn't go home with them I just was there you know and I was there a lot of times when cameras weren't rolling and getting to know them and learning about all the different type of young women on the team getting to know the parents um, and in 11th grade Freddie Gray was killed and it was their junior year and I just the senior year was looming and I had already gained permission from the Baltimore City School System. I already basically had everybody's permission, but what I did was I went back and I had another big meeting and I said, okay, you know, I feel that this film needs to start right now and I think all of you feel that way too. And I just went back, got everybody's permission again and um, we just really dove in senior year. So I spent from the time they were 11 till probably about the 10th, and not even till their junior year did I even go home with them. Um, you know, I did just a lot of filming at school. Navigating the school was a big part of it. You know, it is a school with over almost 600 young women in it. I did not want to interrupt classes. I did not want anyone to feel like you were special because you had a camera crew following you. So I was really particular about that. I had major guidelines for my crew um, and 
make rules around the filming in the school and the filming of the girls, but also knowing everybody's name. And um, that was really important to me. And then, you know, the truth that I believe that none of it would have happened if the mothers hadn't trusted me. Um, if the mothers hadn't trusted me, their daughters would never have been allowed to be with me for many, many hours and travel in cars with me and me be responsible for them. Um, and that extends to, you know, I can say one situation, lesson, um, and was having a really hard time. And I really wanted to film the moment, but I knew it was dicey. And I said, we have to film it. It's much to what Heidi said. We have to film it or then it doesn't, it doesn't happen and we don't have a choice. I said, but, you know, you have to trust me that I'm going to, you know, we're going to talk about this as we go through the process. And, and we did. And I, also, I never thought it would be in the film, but... You know, it was just a process of us talking about it. And then post Sundance, you know, I took 19 girls to Sundance and 10 chaperones. <laughs> and, um, that's amazing. you know, we, yeah, it was crazy. Oh and we got in, and I, they didn't know what Sundance was, and I didn't really know what Sundance was, but we were all going to go to, I was like, we're not going without all of these young women. And um, they came, and it was just this incredible experience. And so my navigation and my relationships with them has changed. And it's changed for the better because they've gained such a sense of independence. And one of the reasons they have is because from the sale of the film, we set up scholarships for all 19 girls in the movie. And I didn't want to just like, give them money. You know, I thought that's not a great idea to give like 17, 16, 18 year olds money. <laughs> um, so we set up, thank you, we set up 529 accounts for them. And to their families about how to use the money for education and um, so that's a different part of the relationship with them and um, it is you know every day I talk to them because they're minors I think the connection is like you know much deeper and stronger and while you only really dive I, into the three girls and I do want to come back to that about yeah. some of the ongoing relationships so let me yeah. pause oh, you ahead. on, on that right. and uh, and then I'm gonna work in uh, Dan Sickles before yeah. I add in I is a beeping that I'm hearing here, and so if I could just ask people to silence their phones or, or their cameras um, uh, so that if we record this, I don't have beeping in the background. Um, uh, Dan, uh, you and Antonio uh, made this beautiful, delicate film, uh, Dina, um, uh, about a couple who um, are on the autistic spectrum. Is that a good way to describe them? Yeah, yeah, they're, they're neurodiverse. That's okay. the best word. And, uh, and, uh, and one of the themes in the film is, you know, is, is them, you know, figuring out uh, intimacy. Um, as we can see in the trailer, it's, uh, you know, very uh, deliberate in the, the, uh, the, the beautiful way that you um, uh, portray this film. There's a lot of uh, humor in the film, but, uh, but also humor that maybe as an audience member you can feel a little uncomfortable about, uh, you know, whether you're uh, laughing with these people or, uh, or at these people. Um, uh, so I'd love to ask, begin by asking you what drew you into um, making this film uh, about Dina and, and you know, how were you thinking about those, uh, those questions of... Those are big questions. Yes. Um, <laughs> well, first, thank you guys for being here. This is, this is pretty cool. I feel like uh, since yesterday, I've just been walking around like, whoa, you know? Because, <laughs> uh, you know, sitting, sitting up here with you guys is awesome. Uh, I've been a fan of your work for quite a bit. So, uh, so thank you, thank you guys. Um, uh, but yeah, no, I, I, I started Dina, it, it, was, it was a pretty quick production. We've, all, we've only really been working on it for two years, um, and I, I include today in that statement. Um, but I've known Dina all of my life. Uh, I, I grew up with her, she was actually my babysitter at one point. Um, and her, her and the entire supporting cast, you know, Frank and, and Monica and Laura and Patrick and, and everybody that populates the film I, I've known for you know, over two and a half decades now. Um, so yeah, we, I, I mean, it, it's kind of a convoluted story. It, it, it came about in a very serendipitous way. You know, we, we were finishing up our first film, which is called Mala Mala, uh, and we shot that down in Puerto Rico. Uh, it focuses on the, the trans community on the island. And uh, I, I lost both of my parents in the span of four months. 
So we, we moved post-production down to Philadelphia. And uh, my dad, he had started this group for adults with developmental disability called the Action Club. And they, they still meet bi-monthly, you know, in the basement of the public library. And while we were down there, you know, editing Mala Mala, I, f I found myself kind of going back to this group, you know, that my dad was no longer leading, more, more for myself than for them, you know. Um, they're a group of people who is, they're, they're very considerate of, of one's needs uh, and, and sort of limitations, and they knew exactly where I was at and, and sort of the grieving that I needed to do, and they were there for me. And, and that's sort of how we, as, as a team, you know, along with Antonio, with our editor, Sophia, uh, with our cameraman Adams started working with this group and that's really how the film started uh, and, and then sort of focused in on Dina who is now a self-proclaimed diva you know she, she sort of she sort of swallowed focus um, and uh, to speak to, to, to your point about humor you know to us I think I think our, our main concern our priority with the film was really creating something dignifying and something, uh, you know, that, that showed her in all of her complexity. And, and relationships are awkward, like, they're, they're weird, especially when they start. Like, they're, they're just full of, of missteps and, and successes that, you know, are, are short-lived sometimes and, and failures, you know, and, and that was something that we were directly investigating once we showed up. We, we realized how open and honest and transparent and, and giving Dina was. Um, and, and just how straightforward she was and what she wanted and what she desired. Um, and, and how willing Scott was to play with us as well, you know, I mean like, the entire film sort of hinges on, on their collaboration and their willingness to, to, to go to those uncomfortable places with us. You know, so, so every moment in the film is, is one that I think of as something that we sort of constructed together. Um, not in the sense of, of manipulation, but in the sense of playing, uh, if, that, if that makes sense. Um, so to me, you know, like the, the humor is complicated because we, we do tend to separate into these two camps, right? Like laughing at somebody or with somebody. And, 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 and I feel like the, there's, there's a way to talk about it in a more complicated way, which I think is something that Dina does in moments. You know, I, I think that there are moments that I'm laughing at her maybe because I recognize something that I also do and, and maybe don't even realize it right away. Um, but she's, she's actually the one that explains all of them very well. You know, there's a moment where she's like in the opening of the film where she's just like trying to, to drink coffee uh, with this oversized straw like hanging out of her cup and she just spills it. And she, she's like the first one to point out like that's hilarious, like what was I thinking of doing that, putting that straw in that cup? You know, so She's been, she's been incredibly brave in, in lending us those moments. And, and she's, been, she's been a collaborator and a partner the, the entire way. You know, we, we would go back and show her and Scott sequences that we were building and cuts and, and talk about it and what was missing and, and maybe moments that didn't ring true or authentically to her and to Scott. Um, but that, that, was, that, was a, that was a big part of, of production and for Pose. So uh, Amanda uh, started to talk about um, the relationship with the subject that continues after the film is, uh, is finished. And uh, you know, the, the first thing that we're talking about here is some of the sense of navigation you have to uh, undergo during the course of making a film. But then when the film comes out and reaches an audience and, and yeah. these, people's are, these people's stories are being told uh, in public, that's a, a whole you enter a different kind of relationship uh, that's sensitive uh, with your subject. Um, I'd like to hear each of you talk about that. Heidi, maybe I can uh, start with you. Your film, One of Us, uh, has only really been out in the world for a few weeks. Uh, now it had its world premiere at the Toronto Film Festival in September, then went uh, live on Netflix to 160 countries. Uh, uh, 190. 190 countries. Uh, with a flick we get emails from South Korea. I need translators. I need help. <laughs> uh, so, uh, what has been your relationship to your film subjects to guide them through this process of suddenly the world having an opinion about their lives? Well, as we all know, the the, 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 the relationship between the director and the subject is. Um, it's a dynamic one and it changes throughout the production. So, you know, I would um, 
bring it, you know, sort of uh, down to, this is a simplistic way to say it, but, but you know, during production, you need them a lot. Yes. And they make the decisions. They're like, I don't feel like it today, and don't call me again, or whatever. Uh, and so you are in need, you're, the, the power, the balance of power is all in their court. So they have all the power. Uh, and then during the edit, when you're done with principal photography, um, the power comes back to you and they're like, hey, how's it going? I haven't heard from you in a while. Is there anything else you need? Can I come by? And, um, and of course, we, we don't show our material to subjects during an edit. It's for us, not never. So I'm fascinated by what you just said. I'd love to talk about that. Um, and so, uh, but of course, this is the first movie we made in New York. Our subjects live in New York. Our office was the only safe space for them to go to ever. Um, and so they were welcome to come anytime. And so the doorbell would ring, and we'd have two edits going, and we had this big black duvetine that we would like throw over <laughs> the, you know, your note cards, act one, two, three. It's like bike accident, um, business. I mean, it's, it's like the way you reduce people's lives into a, a, a note card, and it's like horrible. And it's, you know, it's like drug addiction. Like, you know, terrible. And so you start being so self conscious conscious when your subjects are showing up and they have you want to eat their lunch in your office. So we're like throwing duvetines over and like putting curtains in our edit rooms and be like, don't go in there. Uh, and you know, so there was that. Anyway, um, so the balance of power becomes like, you know, they start to feel insecure because what are you doing with their life in there for those nine months? Then the movie comes out, back to your question. And we always show our films, the finished films, to our subjects um, privately, one by one by one. And we discuss the film, and they can watch it again. Um, so they're not watching it for the first time with an audience. We try to prepare them. We said there's going to be people who think that they know you and stop you on the street. They're going to project their uh, sexual abuse that happened to them in their life. They're going to want to talk about that to you as if they know you. It's going to be weird. And then uh, you're going to be sort of like mythic to some people. And um, they don't really believe you. It sounds silly. Uh, and then it happens. And um, they, it's like a surreal experience for them. And they don't even believe it to be real. And it's so strange. And Loser in our movie drives Uber. And like he's picked up passengers who recognize him uh, from the movie. And it's a, it's a strange thing, especially with a global platform like we have now, which we've never had. So. Um, you know, what we do is we got real, real close. We said, guys, we gotta hang in together. Uh, you gotta decide. We gave the media training how to not answer a question, how to not be somehow dragged into a very uncomfortable conversation with a stranger, um, how to not, you know, to change the answer so that they can say what they wanna say and all that stuff because people really wanna pry. And that they didn't sign up for that. Um, they didn't know what they signed up for. So now it's our responsibility to teach them how to say no and how to say yes, and um, and now they're just like blossoming. Now like, yeah, I turned on the radio the other day and like, unbeknownst to me, like losers on a, <laughs> on a talk show. Um, so it's, you know, they've, they've, they've figured out what they, how to navigate it, and now they're just like embracing and enjoying the experience. And so we're, we're three weeks into it, and they've already very quickly figured out how to make it work for them. But it really was just like trying to prep them, like go into a cocoon for a couple of weeks, and, and try to explain to them how it was going to go and prepare them. And so far, so good. <laughs> uh, Pete, I don't know to what extent you've experienced this either on your film, The Waiting Room, or, or the new film, the, the Force. Have, have subjects from, from your film like, been involved in Q&As or, or other kinds of exposure? Well, I mean, the, uh, CJ, who's sort of the subject of uh, The Waiting Room, I like to say like, there was an Academy Award for documentary character that year, like she would have won that thing hands down. I mean, she's, like, characters like this do not come along too often. And um, I, I, my relationship with her, you know, is ongoing, and um, I, partly because my wife works at the hospital, so I'm, I'm over there all the time. But um, you, you cannot escape that. And, and the, what's more complicated is when the relationships are, are, are are um, where the representation of a character or of a group of people is more complicated, and for that, you know, what I like to, uh, you know, it's really important for you know documentary filmmakers to understand that that is a responsibility. It's not something that you can just turn off, you know, and that the inclination, oftentimes, after you make a film and you represent an individual or a group of people, 
is to be defensive of criticism. You know, that I, I, I never intended to make, make you look bad. Maybe you did. Maybe, maybe some people do intend to do that. But for, 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 for me, making a film about the police and the activist community fighting, uh, pushing back against the police, there, right there, we knew that there was going to be, um, you know, there were, there were going to have to be conversations after that film came out, and I, and that, in, indeed, has been the case with with the force. Is is uh, there's been a myriad of reactions to it, both on from the sort of command staff or, or cops on the on the street who tend to love the film. Mm -hmm. um, so gritty, man. It's authentic. It's real. <laughs> you know, to. The, the upper reaches of the command staff that were involved, and I can't say too much about the film for anybody who hasn't seen it, but it's think, playing let's today just say, at it's playing today at 3.30, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> let's, go. let's just say, we, we, we made the, we, we... Let me ask it this way, when you get pulled over now in <laughs> Oakland, is it a better situation or a worse situation? <laughs> well, 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 while we were making the film, and you know, we're hanging out with these detectives who were telling us, man, you know, like, like, we, we, we play on the edge. Like, we can't do the job that you're asking us to do, keep you safe, if we don't play on the edge, you know? And we're seeing how they actually do things. And then we're editing the film, and we've got all those postcards up on the film, and we've been robbed three times, you know? We see Tony coming in. To, why is Tony, like, walking out of our building? Tony's one of the detectives at the OPD, you know? So we're in our heads, like, thinking, Oh man, like, are we being watched? And they start getting like paranoid. And then, and then for me, one of the most profound experiences I had was when I first got into a police car doing, doing a ride along. Is that that get glare from the public? Who are you? You know, you feel like a cop. You feel the hate. But but after, now we also have that like cops looking at looking at me saying, "Are you the guy that made that film?" You know, and I'm not known. How does he feel? How does she feel about the film? You know, so that that is something that's an ongoing um, uh, discovery of sort of how people have held that film, and it's it's you know it, it is our responsibility as filmmakers after these films come out um, to listen to the reactions and to understand how that film you know made pe the people who um, were represented in it feel. Um, so Amanda, coming back uh, to to your film. The, the, the girls in the film have been a very active part of bringing this film out uh, into the world. Um, uh, can you continue your thoughts about how uh, you've managed that? Um, well, a lot of what Heidi said, you know, um, and, and what all your, everyone is saying. Um, well, first of all, I, um, you know, I did show uh, the girls' scenes, different scenes um, at different points, um, and then we showed it to them the and, and elaborately yeah. for me, yeah. when you were doing that, um, what was the purpose of that? Was that to make them was feel better okay. or to make sure that like, they weren't going to totally veto that? No, I mean, they didn't have control over that, but um, <coughs> I wanted to reassure them. They were, you know, teenagers, super nervous. Um, what Heidi said, you know, there's a very different responsibility on filmmakers today than there was 20 years ago because of the 190 countries and it's just and especially young people you know they all watch everything and everything is available to them and social media and bullying and like all these things I was very concerned about so I felt the need to reassure them we um, we did lots of group sessions stick together when you know, if pe if everyone's trying to kind of, if somebody says something or, you know, it's very awkward with like three girls or the leads and the rest are supporting characters, making everyone feel good about it. Um, so lots of workshops, um, having really, really strong uh, leaders, the teachers, the principals, all the educators were very involved in the decisions of the girls and I look to them as experts to make sure we were making the right decisions for them at all times, um, you know, the girls got to travel the country this summer. They got, it's just this incredible thing about this film is that it has, you know, opened up a world to them. And um, the time we spent together this summer when we were all together were some of the best times. And I just think that, you know, these young women know, don't really quite understand 
what they have done, what they have created, what they have been a part of. And I say to them often, when you have grandchildren and they watch this film, you will know. So I kind of prepare them in that way. Something, and Dan, I'm going to come to you in a second about Dina, but uh, kind of followed by, I don't know if any of you have this experience uh, before with, uh, with the character, but I've seen, you know, real life subjects spend six months or a year on the film festival circuit and they're getting standing ovations. And I, I think of a film that I showed Toronto a, a few years ago called uh, Presenting Princess Shaw. Oh, yes. Lovely film about uh, this uh, young woman singer from, uh, from New Orleans. Uh, you can follow her on Instagram um, uh, where she's very active. And uh, and she's a very uh, level-headed person. But I, you know, I saw her get standing ovations in Toronto and in Montclair and in Traverse City um, and uh, New York City. And uh, and I spent time with her over the course of that year. And I would always, you know, uh, say to her, you know, I hope you realize that this will end uh, as you know as nicely as I could. And she did. She got it. Like she. Did not. Um, uh, I don't. I don't think that she had a bad experience with that. But I do wonder in, in these kinds of things that you're talking about. If you know, you, you you're you're someone who doesn't have the experience of um, of being able to travel uh, the country, and then you do, and then you know the cycle of the film is going to come to an end at some point. I, does anyone have experience in this area? Maybe not. It was hard for the girls to go on these kind of crazy press tour and then come home. So they're you know, being staying in hotels and always having you know lots of food around and everything is kind of taken care of for you and then to go back home. And so there were a few times where we dealt with the highs and lows of that. But the truth is, like, it's you, what Heidi said is so true. You stick together, and if you stick together as a group and as a family, it, you can weather it. Well, one, uh, one funny thing did happen with CJ, which uh, speaks to the power of, of nonfiction uh, characterizations and sort of that authenticity is uh, she, she, she did become like a, a, a celebrity sort of in, in, the, in the community and uh, definitely in that, in that hospital that she would tell me, man, people are stopping me everywhere. I go, you're that woman, you're that woman from the movie. And then my friend who was, uh, Ryan Coogler was making Fruitvale Station and he, you know, Kat, he was like, oh, yeah, I want to bring her in to, uh, you know, you know, cast her for this role. And so we, we went and we went in. We, I took CJ in. I was like, okay, CJ, like, you know, just go in there and just be yourself. You know, we're sitting in the waiting room of the casting, you know, thing. And you can hear the actors, the other actors, and they're, they're screaming and they're doing their thing. And she's like looking at me like, oh, my God. <laughs> and, uh, and she went in there and, like, she came out and she's like, oh, Pete, like, I bombed. I bombed that thing. <laughs> and then I talked to Ryan later and, and, and Ryan's like, oh, yeah, she just didn't. Sucked. <laughs> she just didn't, you know, it just didn't work. Be yourself. God love yeah. her. Yeah. Well, and, the thing is, like, I think it's really important. I mean... First of all, I, we transmit this to all of our subjects. We make documentaries. Like, we, we don't like live large, you know what I mean? We, we, it's like the Cinderella thing happens to us too, then it's over, you know what I mean? It's like, you don't make the short list, no one ever calls you again. Um, <laughs> come on, you know, like, we're very aware of what's going on and what we're doing for a living and like, like uh, we're not changing the times, we're not changing policy, like, I just don't think that happens with documentaries, unfortunately. I think they're so important on so many levels, but we kind of keep our feet to the ground, and so our subjects do too, because we're not like, you know, we're like, it's going to get weird, you're going to get a lot of emails, you're going to get, but, it, but mostly, like, let's, let's emphasize the weirdness and the temporariness of it too, uh, and so I think that they'll take your lead. I mean, it's, um, important that that you set the tone of like what's actually happening here and you know and it was hilarious in Toronto because they all came to Toronto and Netflix had put a per diem of a hundred dollars on each person's hotel room to eat and everything 
and everyone was like racing home at like 10 minutes to midnight to their hotel to make sure they could spend it before the next day. And we were all like texting each other the like $90 omelet. And we're like, enjoy it now, because we gotta go back to it. It was like funny, it's funny. And then Loser realized that it was like carrying over the next day and started leaving $100 chips for the waitress and like trying to hit on the way. It was, it, was, it was funny, and like everyone was like, you know, you text each other their checks from the hotel, like, it's just temporary, you know, I think it's all, our job to set the tone. Yes, they're changing, they're, they've done a wonderful thing, but it's a film, it's one film in the world. Let's everybody keep it together. So, you know, keep it together. So I think that's important that as directors that we set that tone for them. Right. At the same time, though, I guess, you know, for Dina, she doesn't, she doesn't seem very sentimental about certain events, uh -huh. Uh -huh. which is Beautiful. great. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's a relief. Um, but it's, it's strange, too, because like, there's, never, there's never a point where it's like, it's not like a switch. That's, it's like, okay, now you're not... A star, right. I mean, you know. She's always a star. Yeah, I was exactly, yeah. and and I think that and I think that that's something that she's been able to take from all of this, which right. I've really admired, is like, you know, she she's been invisible for so long. She's part of a very invisible community. Sure. Um, you know, one one that's very very often looked looked on with with a certain amount of, you know, reductivism and stuff like that, and and she sort of stepped into these spaces, you know, in, in screenings and in talks and stuff like that, and she's she's taken. You know, like she, she's walking into these rooms where people are treating her with dignity and respect for like the first time in her life, just automatically, and and, and she's she now possesses it. You know, so I think for her, like more than the connection with the film is like getting getting used to and accustomed to spaces like that and sort of carrying it on mm -hmm. for her, which has been cool That's to awesome. to watch. That's awesome. You know, That's cool. I mean, I told I. Totally relate to that. I mean, I thought I could never be prouder of the girls in my film than on when the, the right. last day of filming and watching them navigate all of this. Like every time I cried at every single Q and A, because they were so brilliant <laughs> and so amazing, and they were so brave to do it, and then to do it for all the right reasons to inspire young people across the country and to change, you know, the perception of them. Like it's much like Dina, they're young black women in America, right. and they don't get to see themselves mm -hmm. a lot, and so they felt that they were representing that, and it was really powerful for them. At the same time, though, I think I think it's double-sided, too, because there's a lot to pro then protect them from. You know, I mean, like, Dina's like a middle-aged, empowered woman, and like, we know how they're treated in this country especially when it comes to being represented in media. And, you know, so on, on one hand, I feel like she's having all these wonderful experiences, you know, going out to London and, like, meeting people who love her in London, you know, her fans, like, she, she calls them this. <laughs> she's big in the UK now. Yeah, exactly, but, but at the same time, then, then sort of protecting her from certain stuff that's being written about the film that, you know, sort of refers to her in ways that I know would upset her, you know, like, like, I, I can't I can't even count the amount of times that, that the film has been sort of been called like an, an autism romance, mm. you know, and, and almost to use the term as as a, a, a reductive qualifier, really, you know. Um, there, there was a review that referred to her as overweight that came out a few years, or a few weeks ago that I was like, this is I you know, and, and sort of acting as that buffer between the the, the, the media machine, which is very abstract, and and the the, the core of the film, which is delicate and, and, and sensitive. Um, so so it, it, it's strange. It, it, it's, it's very, it's, it's bouncing back and forth, I feel like, you know. Well, we've got about uh, 10 minutes left, and I want to ask a question that is uh, kind of off topic of navigating sense of relationships and, and talking about the craft uh, in these films. Um, and Dan, I want to start with you. I mean, we can see in that trailer for Dina, that film has such an intentional look about it. I don't know how to describe it. It's like looking at a 1970s photograph. I don't know what you do to uh, to create that. In fact, I'd like you to tell me right now. <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, is that like an Instagram filter? Yeah, no, exactly. That's what it is. Um, no, we, 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 you know, we, uh, the, the film, takes a lot from impressionism, you know? I mean, like, I think the, the way in which we constructed the film, uh, theoretically and aesthetically, you know, it, it, they come from very different places. When it comes to the color palette, you know, we, we were sort of like leaning into these pastels that 
that Dina wears all the time anyway. You know, it's like she, she opens her drawer and it's all these beautiful pinks and, and purples and, and greens. And, uh, you know, sort of being in the suburbs, I, I grew up very close to where we filmed and, and sort of noticing how beige things are, <laughs> uh, which, isn't, which isn't a negative thing, but, but there are all of these different beiges. You know, uh, so, so so like leaning into to what we knew was was there to sort of give it this this anachronistic feel too. I think I think we wanted to lift it out of um, being a contemporary doc in moments too, and and sort of try and, and give it a space that would be more eternal in, in a way. Like you're saying, like it's it's like you reference like seventies photos. Like for me, it's impressionism. Like so, if if we're sort of working with all of these references, then then it can be talked about in, in multiple contexts. You know, as as the world evolves. Well, I'd say I mean that film pays more attention to color, or at least makes me pay more attention to color than any other film I can think of this year. Uh, and uh, and it, it and it does make a difference in the in I think the dignity that you're bringing to the characters. You know. The, the style does. Mm -hmm. um, Heidi, in uh, in your film, there are some stylistic choices that are dictated by the content. Um, for almost the first half of your film, you're refraining from showing the face of one of your key characters, Etty. Um, and as uh, you move along in the year that you're following her, uh, she I think becomes gradually more comfortable with with having her face uh, on camera. So, in your film, there's a lot of uh, long lens uh, kind of uh, observation, and then there's a lot of like intense close up. We're um, uh, we're in this tight space uh, uh, together. Um, can you talk about how you developed the uh, the the look of your film? Oh well, again, you know, you don't want to fight against what is available to you. You will lose. Uh, it's like trying to fight New York City. You'll lose. Uh, so, you know, in all of our films, we really... Unless you're the Abacus Bank. Unless you're... Oh, oh talk about it. That's a, that's a good Zach, joke. that's a nice reference. Good movie. Um, so we always figure out our aesthetic, uh, partly on our dream aesthetic, mixed with reality, what you're facing. So basically we're filming a community that hates to be photographed, that, that doesn't want you there, um, and uh, two secular women especially. And so we started out when we were just testing, doing tests around the community, um, we would start filming into reflective windows at a certain time of day. So if you filmed into the window of a shop, at a certain street at a certain time of day, you had beautiful reflections of all the women that were not knowing they were being filmed, um, walking by, and, and you could get the community basically in a mirror, in a reflection, in a rear view mirror. And so we would just look around for mirrors all the time, and they'd be like, I wonder why those strange people are shooting into like a wheel of a car. <laughs> Maybe they're doing a film on, you know, mechanical, and we're like, yeah, we're just weird. We're so weird. And so, so like, God, and the stuff looked amazing because you get this amazing diffusion which looks expensive. Um, and that's important to look expensive. And uh, we know how to look expensive. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, and so, so, you know, we started doing those sorts of things and we really liked the look. It was kind of 70s also because the community also looks exactly the same as it's looked from the beginning, from when, they, from when they emigrated to the United States after World War II, really, um, even the, the storefronts are the same. And, and so why not, wow, it's like a period piece. Yeah. So we were kind of inspired by, by that first bit of test shooting. And so um, we started, we call it a dirty foreground. I think other people call it that, or maybe it's just us, I don't know. Um, but we always shot behind something, even when we didn't have to. So we'll shoot slightly behind a door jam. Like even though I could be shooting the scene with Loser, he knows I'm there, everyone we could be shooting it uh, up in their grill. I don't like that look for us anyway. So the whole thing was voyeuristic because we're not supposed to be making the film. We're not supposed to be there. They're not supposed to be telling us these stories. So we made the whole thing fully voyeuristic. So everything was shot on the 70 to 200, sometimes with the extender to 300 millimeter when necessary. And I mean, it's a 2.8. It gets a difficult in darkness, but we, you know, you, you can work it out. You get that dreamy look. And so we would be like, slightly behind a plant, or by just a little bit, so you kind of have to be like this. So it's intimacy, but from a distance, yeah? And that, that's kind of what the aesthetic became. And then when you're allowed to get right up on someone, when we, when we decided to do that, it's almost like 
it's almost like a gift back to the audience. Like we're removing the sheen and the, and, and, and the diffusion and like here he is, here she is. So we played with that. We, and we played with the voyeurs and versus the like, you want her? You want to see him? This is what it looks like. This is the kind of, so, so that became our aesthetic, but based on these early test shoots of shooting into wheels and mirrors and stuff like that. Uh, Pete, you do all your own shooting, I think. Uh, uh, what's your approach? It's cheap, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> what, so, uh, what, <laughs> he's, he's saying he's cheap that way because he's. Uh, it's cheaper. I don't yeah. have to hire somebody. Yeah. Oh, it's so much better. Don't even. If I could shoot my own, I would. <laughs> uh, so, what, what was your, you know, uh, approach to this film when you when you start out. What did you think you wanted it to look like? And well, uh, you know, a lot a lot of uh, besides it being cheap, uh, <laughs> I, I I like to shoot. I've always shot my own stuff just because uh, you know. You know and at a certain point, you get uh, you know uh, that that feeling of that connection to to the to the character to the story through through, the, through your own lens is something that. Um, I, I think infuses, sort of at least my style, my style of storytelling, and we go in, you know, every filmmaker goes into this, you know, the beginning of the film, what cameras are we going to use, what lenses are we going to use, and it's like, you want to like go to B&H, what's the latest thing that they got, you know, Able City, you can't go to B &H you know, <laughs> Able City <laughs> website, like, uh, that's true, oh yeah, that's right, <laughs> <laughs> So there, there's just so many. I mean, the technology. There's such a plethora of like a lot of options to um, te technically for how to how to render your film. Now everybody's shooting a. There's that whole thing where like the the, the DSLR is like everybody's like, oh, yeah. you can make your film your film look like a film, you know. So we like I try not to get too caught up in 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 that. Um, it I'm, doesn't matter what you shoot it on. I mean, I hate to hear whatever, that. ultimately, it you can shoot matter. Sean Baker shot Tangerine on an Thank iPhone, you. right? So it, it, the movie looks great. What'd you shoot it on? I'm like, oh, that's the wrong question. Much more important is the sound, in my yeah. my humble opinion. Because you can you can shoot a movie on a Fisher Price camera. Mm -hmm. If it's got great sound, it's gonna work. So true. But if you got if your sound is bad, you, got, you don't have a film, of course, unless it's unless you go a different direction. Uh, so we, you know, I was, you know, much more focused on getting um, into a feel for narratively, what, what do we need to do visually, and that speaks to, it's interesting about, you know, the reflections and, and the hubcaps and things like that. And we, what we noticed was uh, that we're, we're amidst this, this moment where not only are we filming, but people are filming us, filming them, filming the cops, the cops are filming themselves. That, that that idea of cameras and sort of actually the dirty foreground, like you know, lots of sort of um, people collapse right. into that space of of the media and and being watched and and sort of looking at mm -hmm. a piece of video and trying to distill the truth from it. We found that to be really fascinating. So it, it kind of drove to some degree um, our choices, and then organic. Like we, I think you saw in the in the in the um, trailer. A, a, a shot from a helicopter with the spotlight and you know there's the drones now you can get drones they're so fun you know you put the a a7s on the drone you, but we 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 wanted it to i shot that from the helicopter hanging out wow. with just just a seat belt by the way i wouldn't really recommend doing that that's extra cheap Not <laughs> But, uh, and i almost dropped the camera one time because you're like trying to get the shot and you're like leaning out the helicopter anyway but it had it had a very sort of it, we wanted it from the point of view of the police and of the people on the street, and it had that you know whatever. People laugh and say, "I yeah. love that drone shot." Yeah, <laughs> I don't want anybody saying that. Do any of you guys that. use drones? We don't use drones. Have you guys used drones in your movie? Um, it's not in my movie, it's okay. but we have one, we have one, one drone shot. shot. We did use a drone at one point. It's, it's hidden. I'm not going to tell you. It's tempting. I'm telling you, the drones are tempting. Didn't make it. No, they're about to go out of fashion. Skip it. <laughs> Everybody's using them. It's like every movie in Africa. So it's, it's like no, it's like no. I think I think it's going to be, and it's too expensive. <laughs> um, so Amanda, to, uh, to conclude with you in the few minutes that we have, uh, what was the thinking behind uh, your stylistic approach to step? Well, first of all, I really wanted to feel like the girls were in control, that they were like telling a story, and I really wanted to be a fly on the wall, and I really wanted um, the girls to be 
just really front and center. Um, there are really no men in my movie. It's all women. So I really went with that. Um, and that is what the girls were living in. They went to an all-girls school, and most of the teachers are women. So I really wanted you to feel that female power of the film. And then my other big, you know, what you were saying about sound, um, for the step sequences, the thing I really learned is it's not just about what you see, it's about what you hear. And it was so important to make sure that the sound was right, especially when we were filming um, competition scenes where we had one chance to get uh, that performance. That was it. And so it was a lot of choreography. Maybe There'll be a lot of time in a Foley room uh, yes. afterwards. <laughs> yes. Um, we had lots of GoPros. We put GoPros anywhere we could on the stage. I was very nervous about them. At one point, I watched as the girls started to step, they stepped and the GoPro went like that. <laughs> and I was like, ah. And then they fixed it and posed for me. They righted it. It was unbelievable. I almost cried. Um, so I thought the GoPros were not going to be great, but they ended up actually, I think, looking very good. I was really surprised. So to your point, the Fisher-Price um, thing. Um, so, you know, for me, it was learning how to film a step, you know, learning how to be. And what I found is when I was inside of it, um, I, I don't shoot. I wish I did, just like Heidi. Um, so I would stand behind my camera person, just old fashioned with my hands on his hips and we'd go in and out and in and out and try to get out of their way and just really be inside of it. And I also just took great... Sounds like a harassment case. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry, it wasn't like that. Uh, and, you know, I took great inspiration from musicals. You know, I mean, you open the film and the girls tell you who they are. It's their opening number. You know, sisterhood and integrity. Mess with my sister and you mess with me. We step with soul, we step with pride. Leave the ladies till the day we die. And when you first hear that, you, like, don't really know what's going on. You're like, wait, what's happening? And then in the 11 o'clock moment, you hear it. And it means something totally different because now you know them. And it is their anthem. And it is them saying who they are. And so... I used a lot of music and I loved every second of it. I worked with Raphael Sadiq and Laura Cartman on the score. And that was just the cherry on top of the whole experience, um, making sure that we represented what the girls were hearing and what they were, the kind of music they listened to, but also hearing strings and horns and all the things that you maybe don't associate with these women that you're seeing, but that makes them soar, makes the film soar, makes it feel like a movie. Mm -hmm.